Jahren im Bereich Wikileaks. Ähm, viele vergessen das teilweise aufgrund der Ereignisse der letzten beiden Jahre. Es wird ja gesagt, er hat äh, Trump so quasi geholfen, die Präsidentschaft irgendwie zu gewinnen und sonst wie viele Sachen gemacht. Es gibt tatsächlich viel Kritik an einigen Äußerungen und die ist auch berechtigt. Aber für uns ist Julian Assange nach wie vor ein Mensch, der wirklich, kann man sagen, sein Leben riskiert hat. Diesen Juni sitzt er seit sechs Jahren in einem Raum, der glaube ich 25 Quadratmeter groß ist ohne Sonnenlicht, ohne im Prinzip in der Natur zu sein, ohne irgendwie rauszukommen. Ähm, die UNO hat das verurteilt, hat Schweden und Großbritannien aufgrund dieser Situation verurteilt. Ähm, wir werden zum rechtlichen Fall vielleicht im Rahmen der Q&A noch etwas hören. Eine kurze Anmerkung noch. Ähm, es gab im Vorfeld die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen über die kleine Zeitung, unseren Partner. Und viele, einige Leserinnen und Leser haben das auch gemacht. Mit diesen Fragen werden wir dann die Fragerunde nachher beginnen. Aber natürlich wollen wir auch euch die Möglichkeit bieten, hier im Rahmen der Eröffnung, im Rahmen der, also nach der Rede Fragen zu stellen oder auch schon währenddessen. Wir werden das technisch so lösen, weil der Raum ist groß, wir können keine Mikros herumgeben, das wäre zu kompliziert. Meine Kollegin Cornelia wird äh, Fragen einsammeln von euch, die ihr einfach an eine E-Mail-Adresse schicken könnt, nämlich an assange.elevate.at. Schickt einfach eure Fragen hin, die kommen zu Cornelia. Cornelia schickt sie mir über unsere Festival-App Riot hier aufs Mobiltelefon und ich versuche die dann einzubinden. Zeitlich sind wir schon fast wieder auf Wetten das Niveau, zumindest bei 25 Minuten Überzug. Das ist leider ein typischer Elevate-Fall. Aber ähm, wir werden versuchen, nach und nach möglichst also kurz die Fragen halt zu behandeln und schauen, dass wir relativ viel unterbringen. Bevor wir zur Botschaft gehen, ähm, ich hoffe, die Leitung klappt, zeigen wir noch ein kurzes Video, ähm, das durchaus nochmal die, diese Situation, dieser Bedrohungslage von Julian Assange ausmacht. Das ist eine kleine Zusammenstellung von öffentlichen Äußerungen im amerikanischen Fernsehen. High-Tech-Terrorism. Cyber-Terrorism. Information-Terrorism. Shut it down. We're gonna hang you. We use a drone or something. A bullet in the brain. Illegally shoot the son of a b uh, Information warfare is warfare. And Julian Assange is engaged in warfare. Information terrorism, which leads to people getting killed, is terrorism. And Julian Assange is engaged in terrorism. He should be treated as an enemy combatant. WikiLeaks should be closed down permanently and decisively. Should the United States do something to stop Mr. Assange? We're looking at that right now. The Justice Department is taking a look at that. I would argue that it's closer to being a high-tech terrorist than the, than the Pentagon Papers. This disclosure is not just an attack on America's foreign policy interests. It is an attack on the international community. The, the, the head of WikiLeaks is not a particularly credible source in my mind. He's, he is a, you know, to me, in my mind, he's a, he's a criminal and he ought to be hunted down and grabbed and, and put on trial for what he has done here. I think the man is a high-tech terrorist. Um, he's done in Assange. Yeah. He needs to be prosecuted to the full, fullest extent of the law and if that becomes a problem, we need to change the law. Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. I think Obama should put out a contract and maybe use a drone or something. You don't want to act panicked and have the Well, you don't have to act States. panicked. You can act tough and say, if we catch you, we're going to hang you. Yeah. Well, well, whatever. We heard some of that from Holder. Julian Assange is a cyber terrorist in wartime. He's guilty of sabotage, espionage, crimes against humanity. He should be killed. How is it? How is it that the WikiLeaks guy remains free? You know, back in the old days when men were men and countries were countries, this guy would die of lead poisoning from a bullet in the brain, and nobody would know who put it there. The way to deal with this is pretty simple. We got special ops forces. I mean, a, a dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonist, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a b It's time that the Obama administration treats WikiLeaks for what it is, a terrorist organization whose continued operation threatens our security. Shut it down. Shut it down. It is time to shut down this terrorist organization, this terrorist website, WikiLeaks. Shut it down, Attorney General Holder. Dieser Ausschnitt, äh, hat man vielleicht gemerkt, ist nicht ganz aktuell. Julian Assange ist schon hier. Die Leitung klappt. Freut mich sehr. Um, Julian, hello. Can you hear me already? I can hear you, Austria. Good. <laughs> Welcome to the Elevate Festival.
welcome to the Elevate Festival um, 2018. Um, we're very glad that you take the time. Um, our theme this year is risk and courage. And I would ask you to start with your statement and we continue with the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I was in Austria in 2009 and I spoke uh, in Linz. So I, I have some fond memories of the place. Uh, I've just seen that you have, saw a, a video on uh, a compilation of some of the uh, charming statements that uh, have been made about us in the United States. Uh, well, that's quite out of date. There's a, there's a, a lot more, uh, especially in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, and from yeah, from more different uh, types of people, the head of the CIA, for example, uh, Trump's head of the CIA, has said that WikiLeaks is a non-state intelligence agency. Uh, whatever that is, uh, it turns out basically that's the press, right? Uh, journalists uh, go out, or at least they should, develop sources, uh, protect them, take their information and publish it. Uh, interestingly, intelligence agencies do the same thing, but without the intent of publishing. Uh, it's a key difference. And it's quite interesting, this Pompeo doctrine, because it uh, uh, is a, a pretty serious threat to the press in general. And once the United States starts pushing a line like that, you can expect uh, its alliance partners uh, to take it. But if you, if you listen quite uh, closely uh, uh, to that video, well, actually, um, I was involved in, in putting it together. Um, and while, of course, you might imagine seeing all that uh, is, is pretty shocking, actually the, the shock starts wearing off uh, quite quickly. Human beings are, are very adaptable. Uh, they adapt to good circumstances and bad. Uh, and we had a lot of fun uh, creating that. The, the music that you hear in, in the background uh, it's slightly spooky. Hopefully you didn't hear it at all. Uh, you don't hear uh, good music if it's, if it's in a video. Uh, is uh, Flight of the Bumblebees. And we uh, slowed this down uh, 9,000 times. So uh, even uh, in such circumstances where uh, you're having major power players making statements like that, uh, you, can still, uh, you can still have fun with them. And so that's what I wanted to talk on, the, the importance of courage uh, for having an entertaining life, uh, uh, for having a fulfilling uh, and inspiring life, for having fun. Um, the various organizations um, that have done bad things that we have exposed. Uh, well, most of them are in the business of trying to install fear into people. Uh, they don't actually need to be able to carry out uh, their threats. They just need to uh, have people uh, believe that there's a serious chance that they might. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a very, very important lesson from this, it, my experiences uh, and the experiences of the rest of our staff over the last eight years. Um, that actually there's a, an attempt uh, to use my situation as a general deterrent, which I'm not very happy about. Uh, but I, I want to put it in perspective. Um, so how much risk is there uh, being WikiLeaks or working for WikiLeaks or visiting me here at the embassy or uh, donating to WikiLeaks or to its legal defense or, or supporting us. That videos like the one you just saw uh, suggests that the, the risk is unlimited. But in fact, uh, there has the number of people that have um, been imprisoned uh, who work for WikiLeaks. Well, it, it's just me uh, for 10 days. 
okay, yes. Then I had very severe house arrest for 560 days and and about 2,000 days uh, in this embassy with a um, an ongoing uh, battle with the British government, which is spends about five million pounds a year uh, in a, a type of high tech siege around the embassy. But uh, I haven't been killed. I haven't been assassinated. Uh, no one else working for WikiLeaks has even been arrested. Uh, no one has been prosecuted uh, for supporting us. It hasn't come about because all those threats are completely empty. Uh, it's come about uh, because we have intelligently managed those threats. Uh, now, despite the difficulties of uh, my personal situation is a physically uh, arduous in various ways situation. Uh, we're able to continue publishing uh, and have published uh, on average a million documents every year uh, and continue to do very uh, meaningful and significant work that makes life satisfying. So I think that is the first step in a, in a genuine courage, that actually there's not much courage needed uh, to act in a way that appears to be uh, courageous. Because um, the, those who are trying to, uh, those authorities that are at attempting to stop people, in our case, uh, knowing the truth, but in other cases, uh, secure liberty for one group or another. First, look to create a perception of fear in people. And they have become extremely skilled at it. Um, and the more developed the society and the economy, the more skill uh, in installing that fear without resorting uh, to assassinations. Now, there, there are, of course, circumstances which is, arise, as they have in Syria and Libya, uh, and before that, Iraq, uh, where uh, the desire to ins install fear is actu actually backed uh, by serious military force, and people are killed. But for, for most of us, that is not the case. Uh, and for those of us who have the luxury uh, of living in countries which have not fallen uh, into war, uh, I believe that it is, it is our duty, uh, it is a, a weight on all of us to try and use our luxurious position uh, in the West to see through uh, the illusions of fear uh, in order to ensure that those people uh, in other countries don't face uh, the reality of war. And we have, we have made some significant contributions to that, um, of which I am proud. So, so that's my uh, thesis, that most fear is installed in people by those in power, uh, looking to dissuade them from actions that they can actually more or less safely, uh, safely take. Okay, so I would be happy to open up to questions now. Okay, I want to remind you, you still can send emails to Cornelia, which will pass them on via Riot to me on stage. A few questions are coming in already. But I want to start with a question from a reader of our media partner, Kleine Zeitung. It's a question about your ongoing case uh, of, Wiki of yourself actually still being caught up in the embassy. You just recently had a court, uh, court date, and the journalist from Italy uncovered a lot of well, weird things in the case between Sweden and uh, England. Um, 
especially with this email exchange that has been released um, in between the Crown Prosecution Service and the Swedish authorities. Can you maybe tell us a little bit, an update on your case, what's the actual status, and what's the, the British, as far as we understand, are still threatening to arrest you because of a breach of bail. Is that right? No. <laughs> okay. uh, as it has been presented as such, uh, the UK government formally has a warrant for my arrest. Uh, and that warrant for my arrest was very strangely secretly issued in 2014. Uh, and it is, I have not been charged with breach of bail. The, the government claims that it might want to, if I am brought before a court, that perhaps it may want to then uh, charge me with a breach of bail, but they have explicitly twice in the past not done so. And that's not surprising uh, because the UK is a party to the 1951 Convention on Refugees and has an obligation uh, to uh, respect uh, any bona fide refugee um, um, actions to um, seek asylum. And, uh, and I have successfully applied for asylum. The US case, I mean, you've heard in that uh, interview, started in about May 2010. Uh, and a grand jury was erected in Alexandria, Virginia, a Pentagon war room with uh, 20 uh, people operating 24 7 trying to understand their publication, what we're going to publish, and contribute to building a case. So over many publications, that has expanded and contracted. Uh, but the formal uh, case against me, perhaps uh, one other person associated with WikiLeaks, uh, has continued the whole time and has uh, expanded as time, time has gone by. Uh, you know, there's a saying that no good deed uh, goes unpunished. Unpunished. There was an attempt to, by Ecuador, to uh, well, a formal uh, dialogue was set up between Ecuador and the UK uh, with three part three diplomats and lawyers on each side, six all together, a panel to meet every couple of months to try and uh, resolve uh, the impasse. I have asylum. All that's necessary is for the UK to respect. Uh, its obligations under the asylum convention and not extradite me to the United States, because that's what I have asylum in relation to. So far, the UK refused. Um, but as a result of being in, involved in, uh, I have to be care a little bit careful legally, but as a result of being involved in uh, rescuing Edward Snowden from Hong Kong and getting him asylum, uh, the UK government decided to kill that uh, in uh, 2013. And so the impasse is continued. Uh, I, I, we have a seemingly a knack uh, of uh, publishing new material or other things that uh, creates a geopolitical pressure on the United Kingdom uh, to not uh, do the easy thing, not to do the right thing, which is simply to respect its obligations under the 1951 Convention on Refugees. Okay, I have um, another short question here now from the audience. Uh, only three words. Was it worth? It's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and, of course, everyone wants me to say yes, but I think that, that it's in some sense not yet definable. Uh, it, it depends on what occurs. Uh, if you engage in various forms of sacrifice uh, for a cause you believe in, of course, at the, at the time that you're doing it, th this is often extremely satisfying, and it lets you learn a lot about the world as a result of conflict. Because your, your ideas about how the world works and how human beings work and how society works, they have to be tested by experiment. And the best experiment uh, is conflict with uh, the structures that run the world. That's how you can both test your ideas about how they actually work and also gain new information. So that, so that has certainly happened to be very uh, intellectually satisfying. And the, 
solidarity of others uh, that has been emotionally satisfying in a, in a very important way. Uh, on the other hand, there are, of course, many, many disappointments in the, I, I, can, I can tell you, in this kind of position, you do get a rather dim view uh, about the characters of, of many human beings uh, and what, how, how easily human character uh, is susceptible to conform or susceptible to fear uh, or susceptible to greed or, or opportunism uh, or duplicity or hypocrisy. That, that aspect, I would say, has been uh, less, less than endearing. Uh, and the, the sum total depends uh, on what your work goes on to do. The example that you set, uh, the, the fruits of your labor. Probably looking at, at the most likely path, it's probably worth it. It, it, does, it does depend. Yeah. It, it, I, 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 don't like, I don't like when people automatically say, yes, uh, it's worth it when the game is played. It's, it depends on what the outcome is. Okay. Um, another question from one of the readers of Kleine Zeitung. Willy Baum is asking, Mr. Assange, would you categorize the British legal system of the 21st century as adequate or regressive? It's like many legal systems. Um, it has a breaking point, uh, and it exists to predominantly uh, serve the interests of the establishment, the ruling class, uh, their, their property rights, and so on. And occasionally, it, it can puppet to other people as well. That's, that's, that's the nature of legal systems. Of course, they, in, they engage in elaborate, elaborate uh, reputational displays. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, have you ever what, here in the UK? Have you, have you ever noticed that defendants wear suits when they go to court? Why is that? The judges should be impartial, right? What difference does it make if you wear a suit or not? Everyone knows it makes a difference uh, because it's about class. Uh, similar, similarly, lawyers have to say your honour. Why do they have to say that? Uh, they have to say that because otherwise the judges will take revenge against the case uh, for, for that slight as, as to their authority because the lawyers are not bowing and scraping enough. Um, this can be put into concrete terms. Um, there's a, a review by the, funded by the European Union by the Judicial Society of the EU uh, of the um, judiciary across the EU. It came out last year. And according to that review, 43% of UK judges say that the government uh, does not respect their independence uh, and, and has not respected their independence within the last two years. So, so some, whatever event that caused them to come to that belief uh, has happened within the last two years, 43% say that. Uh, that is the highest with the exceptions of Poland, Bulgaria, uh, and Albania. So the, so the, the reality, the, the presented reality of judicial systems is always an illusion, uh, like the presented reality of many institutions. Uh, but there are some figures, and, and they're quite concerning. You can look up Aust Austria uh, in that. Um, I tweeted it, I think, uh, two days ago. Okay, um, another question, a bit of a longer one, again from the room, from Robert Yoli. Litigation PR is the art of damage control in the public opinion, and often includes attempts to undermine the credibility of opponents with any means available. How can media and civil society resist or circumpass these litigation efforts that can comfortably rely on highly organized state or private organizations? I'm not sure what being got at there, I assume you're talking about litigating people who are speaking about things uh, that, that damage the reputations, uh, presumably rightly, uh, of one institution or organization or another. 
Well, it's, I mean, if you, you can create publishers that are pretty much immune to litigation, uh, WikiLeaks has done that. Uh, anyone who's, who's sort of serious uh, can set up a, a trans-jurisdictional uh, publishing operation, um, which we have. What, it's, it's quite astounding, in my view, that more publishers do not do that. And it makes me question how serious they are in preventing themselves being gagged. Generally, I believe that most newspapers just don't want to be gagged more than others in their economic niche. So it's, they, it's about the economic competition that they have, say, with, within Austria, for example. Uh, it would be annoying if one newspaper was gagged in Austria more than another, uh, so they proceed aggressively on that. But if they're both gagged, uh, it doesn't make any economic difference. And so there's no uh, proper incentive. But yeah, if, if you're serious about free speech and if you're serious about not being censored uh, easily, you can increase the cost tremendously by uh, engaging in various forms of multi-jurisdictionality. Uh, and in the case of WikiLeaks, uh, well, also we, we create our own general deterrents. There have been a couple of cases where a big Swiss bank, for example, the, the largest uh, private Swiss bank, Julius Baer, tried to sue us in the United States. Uh, and it cost them a lot. Uh, it cost it maybe $300 million in a, in a lost uh, IPO, which had to be delayed because of the bad publicity. Okay, um, one more question from the audience here. Um, it's about WikiLeaks. Um, how is the current organization's uh, structure arranged? Basically, probably well, I meaning... See, how I see in the Washington Post uh, uh, reference to a CIA report from December or November last year. So, of course, the CIA makes reports about us, and apparently these Washington Post journalists had access to it. Uh, I do, know, I do know that the CIA was trying to feed them things. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, uh, and according to that, the CIA doesn't have a understanding as to WikiLeaks' internal structure. Uh, and you won't and reveal I, us I, to I, us either, probably. <laughs> um, OK, um, I want to ask a, a final question, uh, one basically from me from the Elevate Festival. I would be curious, um, what's next with WikiLeaks? How do you see yourself in this situation? Do you think you will m be able to leave the embassy, go to Ecuador to actually attend your, your asylum? And um, are there any plans for new, re new releases of WikiLeaks? Is there anything in the pipeline that you could tell us already about? There's, as there usually is, there's things in the pipeline that take, a, that take quite some time to work. Uh, to work through. Um, uh, for me, it's an interesting question. We had a, a very important moment uh, in February 5, 2016, uh, when after 18 months of lit litigation, uh, litigating the UN, sorry, litigating uh, Sweden and the uh, United Kingdom at the UN, uh, we won. The UK appealed and lost again subsequent uh, Later on in that later on in that year, uh, Sweden then uh, dropped its uh, preliminary investigation. Uh, I was never even charged; I had already been previously cleared. Uh, the UK now continues using an absurd excuse uh, that it, it wants to keep around the warrant from that dropped extradition case under the basis that maybe uh, if I am pulled into court, it might want to charge me for changing my house arrest location in 2012 without uh, its permission. But of course, uh, it's a holding maneuver, because as soon as I'm in custody, uh, then the UK, can, sorry, then the United States can serve its extradition warrant. The, the geopolitically, the situation is increasingly good. Uh, in that there's a lot of scrutiny in the United States uh, domestically and from other countries uh, as, as a result of the uh, Trump presidency. So that's, that's creating a lot of churn. 
uh, that's causing to pe people to look at the behavior uh, of intelligence agencies and the Department of Justice and so on. Uh, the previously, just really the far left was doing that in the United States. Uh, now there are elements in the right that are also doing it, and the whole world has become more critical about uh, abuses of US power. You can, you can put a, the, you can measure that. Uh, there's a approximately 20% across the board uh, decrease in approval for the actions of the United States government since 2016. That's, that's, that's serious. Uh, that's probably substantially contributed to why Laurie Love, for example, was not extradited. Um, in the UK, US approval rating has gone from 70% to 50%. Uh, in Germany, from 65% to 45%. That's, that's important. And it, it's, uh, the United States is a great country. Uh, in many, in many important respects, but all countries need to be scrutinized in terms of their geopolitical behavior when they, you know, when they become so dominant, when they become hyper-dominant. So, so the geopolitical environment is increasingly positive. The shifts at the UN and the various um, revelations that are coming out, uh, thanks to journalists like Stefania Morizzi about the corrupt behavior in the UK government and ha how, if you like, it's rigged this situation since 2013 uh, are also shifting uh, public opinion. Ultimately, in a political case, uh, the answer is politics. It depends on what various people and elites think, what, what's good for them and what's bad for them. Okay, and um, lastly, I want to address criticism that we also, at the festival, we got a lot of criticism for inviting you. Um, and the criticism is based on tweets that you send, public tweets that you tweet out from your personal account. Uh, several examples are being mentioned also in a recent letter by a DM, a DM group from Leipzig addressing it publicly. Um, this criticism about, you know, some tones of, you know, anti-feminist or anti, even anti-Semitic people uh, call you out um, as a part of a strong criticism. Um, how do you react to that? Is there, can we expect a public response? And also, maybe also wanted to ask about this direct message conversations. I mean, Twitter, you obviously, your organization knows that this is like a postcard or it's a public communication in many mm -hmm. ways. So this is something that uh, I think many people wonder, how, how does that fit in? Also this communication with, uh, as we call it, uh, parts of the alt-right, this was people were criticizing. How do you react to that criticism? Or, and do you plan to have a public um, comment on the open letter by the DM members in Leipzig? No. Uh, it, it's nonsense. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a It's a displeasing feature uh, of, I don't want to say fake activists. Uh, some people are simply ill-informed. It's very easy to be ill-informed uh, as a result of the incredible uh, propaganda war against WikiLeaks. But let's look at it simply. Uh, our publications have been spotless flawless in terms of their accuracy over a period of 11 years. Uh, they're unattackable, they're unimpeachable in any direct sense. So the only way to attack them is to, is to somehow discolor uh, that very hard fought for reputation for accuracy. Now, it's, there's, those battles have gone on back and forth and we have conclusively won uh, the battles for our reputation for accuracy. So all that can be done is to try and muddy that, to, to put a distractor over that um, reputation that comes about as a result of hard work and struggle. And so, yeah, they will grab anything. I mean, it's a, it's a serious business. I mean, what, what happens, what do you think happens when uh, the CIA uh, head uh, declares publicly that they're going to, to take you down uh, and makes re repeated comments. Uh, when there's a, the Pentagon has a war room or had a war room, 
of 120 people operating 24 7. Uh, these are uh, as serious forces and they, they have access to the media and they spread their poison uh, constantly. And that then creates a gradient that some others choose to surf. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question as to why they do. My, my, uh, my, my view is caustic uh, on why they choose to do that. Um, and it's, it's a, an economic causality. Um, unfortunately, within some uh, portions of the, of the establishment press and so on ha has its many attacks, very, very nasty. They also instrumentalize the same stuff. But I think that's easy, easier to understand and not particularly interesting. Uh, the other forms of instrumentalization, I think are a little, a little more interesting. But basically, uh, within, within every, every movement needs an economic basis. And the uh, proper economic basis of the left uh, in history has been unionism. That's been its economic basis. Occasionally, there have been, been churches and sometimes some mass membership political organizations and their membership fees. But now we are in a situation where, broadly speaking, in the West, there is no economic basis for the left. Uh, there, there are connections to political parties and government and the patronage that comes from that, that, that of course, occurs to all parties that might get in government um, and the jobs that they can hand out. Uh, but, so without an economic basis, one is left, left with a uh, subsidiary motivation uh, and that is reputation, the reputational economy. And the reputational economy is based on another economy, which is the attention economy. And the attention economy is a zero-sum game. There's a finite amount of attention. Uh, and for you to get some, you have to take it from other places. Uh, now, WikiLeaks is famous uh, for being persecuted and its publications. Uh, so it has, a, it, it has a lot of wealth in the attention economy. And I personally have a lot of wealth in the attention economy. But my wealth is being famous for being persecuted, severely persecuted. Uh, and within the left, there are some who, who are all about, in their view, equalizing disparities in wealth. And the particular wealth that they have been going for is this reputational economy wealth. Uh, so because the mainstream press is always looking for ways to attack WikiLeaks and to attack me because of its coupling uh, to existing uh, security and big business establishments. Uh, those who are after attention are able to get themselves, uh, get um, re-reported by the mainstream press uh, by attacking me. And I, I'm a, it, it's just, it really is, in most cases, just that pathetic. Uh, it, it's, re it's really pathetic. OK. Well, <laughs> we addressed uh, the criticism that is there. Um, it's, uh, I mean, my... I'm, I'm a human being. I'm a human being with my faults and my errors. And you know, if so you do would, a you, lot, would you admit, would you you admit... Lot, of, course, of course, there are things that can be de decontextualized or whatever. But uh, is there tweets that you kind of regret? Are there some tweets that you regret? I mean, maybe. Who cares? It's like it, on the... Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's in, in a world where the president of the... How, how do you see that in a world where the president of the United States is tweeting, as you probably know, like outlandish things? Um, is this kind of muddying the waters? I mean, or should we pay less attention to what people pay, uh, publish on Twitter? Uh, there's a much bigger question. Uh, the, but, Julian, the dynamic in, in dynamic in the United States uh, with the with the election of Donald Trump is a very interesting dynamic. Uh, you had an, an the power condensing around the new the newly expected anointed leader Hillary Clinton uh, for years, 
that power consolidation had been occurring in the expectation that she would be president. Uh, and this upset uh, that Donald Trump became president it caused a shockwave and it, it caused tears uh, in the fabric uh, of that expected consolidated power structure. Uh, and those tears have, have spread out and they're being adapted to in various ways. And of course, uh, Trump has been tamed uh, to significant degrees by the different establishments with the United States. They have, they have, their, have their debate. And there's been obviously some ugly phenomenon also that have come about, although I think that's really already, already there. It's not, it's not simply Donald Trump uh, causing it, it's more pandering to it. Um, but it's, um, so there, there are, are moments where uh, we and others can draw attention to, in, in that conflict, draw attention to the realities uh, of war and intelligence agencies and big business and so on. Uh, encourage the perception of the reality of the United States and some other countries. And I think achieve import, important, uh, yeah, qu quite important uh, education of, of different groups that wouldn't normally be uh, susceptible to that education. The, the issue of our information sphere, our information universe, that we have to deal with as human beings is another problem, a much, a much bigger problem than Donald Trump. Uh, I think it's our greatest challenge now that if we look at the direction of AI, artificial intelligence, and the, the so, automation of the production of information that flows across, political information, uh, cultural information, then we're heading into a, a very postmodern world, a, li a little bit like the transformation from uh, classical physics uh, into a quantum description of reality, a slightly blurred, unpredictable reality that, that, human, that human beings can't, can't, pro can't probably, probably, sorry, the human beings can't um, possibly assess and therefore make our determinations on. That is a very serious problem that all human societies will have to face. Uh, and it is politically uh, being used by Facebook, Google, and the, the other intermediaries uh, as a, their excuse as to why they should manage the information space of uh, human civilization. They're, they're not just simply robber barons that can sit by, but rather they have become, in some sense, kings of our information space. And they have, they have a, uh, the obligation of the nobles to intervene uh, and to manage human perception uh, on broad scale. That, that is truly a threat to, to everything that everyone does. Because everything that you do is based upon your perceptions. There's nothing else to base it on other than what you perceive. Uh, and if your perceptions are being changed en masse in bulk by artificial intelligences that uh, we have a very hard problem perceiving and that move at speeds faster than we can understand them, uh, then to, to some, then human politics as we know it is over and human culture as we know it is, is gone and the human management of human affairs uh, is no, will be nothing like we are familiar with. Yeah, that's a very bleak um, <laughs> um, yeah, outlook. That's a reality. And it's also why we at the Elevate Festival offer and um, <laughs> talk about different technologies, about de decentralization and about um, making things different, basically. So, since we are way over time already, I want to ask you maybe if you have a few, you know, it's an Elevate Festival, so maybe you have a few, also a positive word or a message to the audience of ah. Elevate. <laughs> I don't need a positive message. <laughs> the, the, the negative message is really important. Uh, <laughs> the inform information space will be dominated 
by artificial intelligences, and that means the end of human politics, as, as like anything that we can conceive. Okay. But on the, on the, on the other hand... Uh, child mortality is decreasing. Uh, maternal mortality is decreasing. It's not, it's not a joke, it's not a joke. There, there's a lot of uh, longed for uh, statistics about the human condition, uh, which are improving and have been improving over really 40 years. And they continue to, they continue to improve. But how much uh, influence we're able to maintain to pursue our shared interests, I think is questionable uh, when we no longer control how we perceive the world. Okay. Uh, the, the, the maybe a part answer. The, 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 part, the part answer, uh, look, uh, we had the, our battle with the NSA. You know, I've been having battles in relation to cryptography since the 1990s, and we, we've won repeatedly important parts of those battles. The battle against uh, Orwellian state control uh, that the National Security Agency threatened uh, was the answer is cryptography. Um, it's not a complete answer, but it's a, sub it's a substantial answer. Uh, the battle against artificial intelligence is not feeding the damn thing. It's stop, stop feeding Google. Uh, it needs to train on what human beings do. So when, when human beings give over their lives, document their lives, to, to information services that are accessible uh, by Google and Beidou and so on, uh, we are laying the foundations for our own uh, predictability and the erection of artificial intelligences which can operate uh, within the human space. Not, run, not runaway killer robots, but rather runaway giant corporations that have uh, that tremendous capacity. And they will use it just like corporations always have used uh, advantages compared to others to extend their domain uh, of domination over others. Okay, well, I would say we are way over time and we thank you especially for taking the time to speak to us here in Graz at Aust in Austria for the Elevate Festival. Well, we wish you all the best and respect, I guess, for enduring almost six years in the American Embassy. Ja, ich habe schon erwähnt, Wetten, das Niveau haben wir wieder geschlagen, oder? Ja. Wissen Sie mal drüber. Aber ich hoffe, es war trotzdem spannend und ich hoffe, ihr bleibt auch noch fürs Musikprogramm. Es geht natürlich jetzt erst los mit dem Festival. Ähm, morgen ab 12 Uhr im Forum Stadtpark mit Heather Wokus Einführung in die Psychologie von Risiko und Courage. Schwere Empfehlung bei freiem